Um, and yes, I see this question uh, from Kathy and Kowalski. We will be sharing out a link to the recording. Um, so feel free to um, use that and watch later or use with your colleagues. Great. Well, good morning. My name is Joanne Kilgour, and I'm the executive director here at the Ohio River Valley Institute. Um, it's great to see so many people joining this morning, and I'd really like to thank you all for being here and welcome you to our event today. Um, this morning, we're releasing two new reports. The first is titled Destined to Fail, Why the Appalachian Natural Gas Boom Failed to Deliver Jobs and Prosperity and What It Teaches Us and the Centralia Model for Economic Transition in Distressed Communities. These reports explain why natural gas development failed to deliver jobs and prosperity in our region, and also what we can learn from the experience of the Centralia Washington community to implement a new economic development model that can deliver. This morning, you'll hear from our lead author and senior researcher with the Ohio River Valley Institute, Sean O'Leary, Green County, Pennsylvania Commission Chair, Mike Belding, University of Akron economist, Amanda Weinstein, and hopefully if he's able to get the tech to work, Belmont County, Ohio Commissioner, Mike Bianconi. After our panel discussion, we'll open the event to your questions. So feel free to use the chat as we're presenting and I'll make sure to log all your questions and answer them in the Q&A after our panelists present. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us, and I'm now pleased to introduce the lead author of the report, Sean O'Leary, to provide more insight into his findings. Sean? Yep. Thank you very much, Joanne, and uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for attending, because for reasons that I'll talk about in my remarks that are to follow, I think this is a remarkably important couple of reports that are coming out because we're at a particularly a uh, pregnant moment in time, I think, for the transition of the economy in the region in Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and particularly in the counties in North Central Pennsylvania, Southwest Pennsylvania, and in the greater Ohio Valley. Um, there are really three facts that I profoundly hope you will take away from these reports and share them with your readers and listeners. The first is that between the original Frackalacha report, which Ben will post a link to um, in the chat, and also the companion report that we're releasing today, we know that the Appalachian natural gas boom hasn't just failed to deliver growth in jobs and prosperity so far. We now know that it is structurally incapable of doing so which means that a lot of economic development strategies in the region need to be rethought. And I'll be happy to discuss the specific reasons why that is in the Q&A. But again, I think the, the, the lesson that we have to uh, internalize is that because the natural gas industry is structurally incapable of generating significant growth in jobs and incomes, it will be necessary for communities in the region that have uh, premised their economic development strategies on that industry to, again, rethink the, what they're doing and how to go forward and look for alternatives. The second thing that I hope you'll take away today is that those communities that I was just talking about whose economies have been distressed for decades in many cases, and that feel threatened by the transition to clean energy, uh, which describes a lot of places in Ohio and Pennsylvania, we're now offering them a model of economic growth and prosperity that they can emulate, that they can use, um, whose principles that they can take and apply to their local circumstances. Because right now we know that that model is driving economic job and population growth at twice the rate of the US economy in a community, albeit in Washington state, but in a community that looks for all the world like many of ours uh, in terms of both its history, its dependence on fossil fuels, both a coal mine and a power plant, its size, 
and its circumstance in the world, 90 miles from the nearest metropolitan area, a very rural community. And so the parallels are quite strong. And I hope and think that the parallels would be quite strong in a recovery, um, given a strategy similar to the one that's in place in Centralia, Washington. And finally, the third thing that I, I really hope you'll take away today is how imperative it is that local and state leaders shift the directions of their economic development strategies now, because, I mean, you really don't have to look any further than the events of the past couple of weeks to know that counties and people in this region first are already getting a bad deal from the natural gas boom and the failed vision of fossil fuel and petrochemical prosperity. And in fact, in many ways, we're watching you know, that dream or that vision crash down. And it was just last week that PTTGC, the Thai company that's considering construction of a cracker in Belmont County, Ohio, found a cheaper way to expand its presence in the petrochemical industry. It purchased another company for a little less than $5 billion. And that purchase reduces PTTGC's available capital and makes it even less likely than it was before that the Belmont County Cracker Project will ever go forward. Second, it was just announced um, yesterday that the Zimmer coal-fired power plant in Ohio will be retired in May 22, reminding us that those dominoes just keep falling and are gonna to continue to fall. Um, I know I testified recently before the West Virginia Public Service Commission in the case of involving the Mitchell coal-fired power plant in Moundsville, West Virginia. And that, the effort that many are making to try to keep that plant open suffered a major blow just a few days ago when the Kentucky Public Service Commission rejected a plan that would have kept Mitchell open until 2040, choosing instead to approve a plan that would result in a shutdown in 2028. And needless to say, there are many other communities throughout the region that with coal-fired power plants uh, that are very likely to go the same route. And then finally, the last thing that I'd like to point out in that regard is that recently we've heard lots of news about efforts to try to basically save uh, the natural gas and fossil and, and coal industries. You know, we've heard about um, funding for carbon capture and sequestration technology. We've heard about hydrogen and subsidies for that. But I think the point that we need to understand about that is that even if carbon capture and sequestration proves to be viable, which is far from a sure thing since it hasn't become technically viable yet, even if it were to be so, and even if we were to absorb the immense incremental costs to retrofit facilities that are already not economically uh, competitive in the marketplace, all that we would end up with from that effort is a situation no better than the one we have right now. And the one we have right now is not good. And so there is a compelling, compelling need right now for the region, first of all, to really explore and understand and begin to implement transition strategies. In fact, the concept of economic transition really needs to take root in the region, because otherwise I'm afraid that we're going to see a continuation of the kind of decline that we've seen for the last 50 years. And as the example of Centralia points out, it's not necessary, it can be different. And so the last thing that I'd like to, I guess, point out is that, you know, sometimes I feel like a Cassandra uh, communicating a relentless litany of bad news and horrible things. But I want to leave it on this note. Not only does the Centralia model provide us with a possible way forward, something that can be emulated by communities, but it is very likely that quite soon the resources that are necessary to fund a Centralia-like model will, in, will become available.
I mean, the one obvious source of that is that we know that there are bills making through Congress, including one sponsored by uh, West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, that would provide $4 billion in the area of energy efficiency, which is one of the areas uh, that was featured in the Centralia plan and for which the report that we're releasing outlines the reasons why those investments are particularly stimulative from an economic standpoint and have contributed so heavily to what's going on there. And we also know that the Biden administration is prioritizing communities in Appalachia and in the greater Ohio Valley for, uh, for those funds. And so that is one relatively near and potential source of funding um, for the kinds of transition strategies. But I would also point out that, of course, if you've looked at the report, you may know that the Centralia model, the Centralia plan, was actually funded entirely by the um, company Transalta Corporation that owned the coal mine and the power plant there. Um, they devoted $55 million to that, comp to that community. And so I hope that in cases, for instance, like the Mitchell plant in Moundsville, West Virginia, if it were to be retired in 2028, the American Electric Power, the company, the parent company that owns the plant, would save approximately $100 million in what would otherwise be required retrofits. And if they do, in fact, realize that savings from closing the plant in 2028, it would be the not only make good policy, but frankly, it would be the moral thing to do to share a substantial portion of those savings with the community to compensate the county for lost tax revenue, but to fund the kind of transition for Marshall, Wetzel, and Ohio counties and Belmont County in Ohio that we see in Centralia. And so as we see plants like the Zimmer plant being shut down, we need to see an expectation built up that the companies that own those plants will contribute not just to worker training, but to community economic transition. And so I, hope, I think that that intersection of both a model that we believe and there's evidence that it works and the future availability of funds will give us the impetus that we need to really tackle this problem. Because I, I'll just close by pointing out that one of the virtues of the Centralia model is that it's not a bet on the come. When you invest and make the kinds of investments that are being made there, the results are felt almost immediately. And we're talking about a region, including my hometown, that's you know lost nearly half its population. Um, that needs this kind of help and this kind of thinking and this kind of new direction right now. So again, I will be happy when uh, after the others have uh, made their presentations, I'll be happy to answer any questions about the reports. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Amanda Weinstein, whose work uh, helped inspire these reports and our attempts to answer that all important question what's the economic development alternative to natural gas and coal? So Amanda, please. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so Sean offered me the opportunity to share some slides and I feel like as an economist, we love our slides. So <laughs> I will take that opportunity. So this work is based on um, a paper I have with my colleagues at Ball State University, Mike Hicks and Emily Warnell. And really the question that we wanted to ask in this research was, when you heard Sean talk about these towns transitioning and they need this transition. So the question we wanted to ask was, well, what makes these towns nice? What can help them transition? So when you talk to any real estate agent, right? They will tell you, right? That house, that real estate market is all about three things, location, 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 right? But what makes that location nice? And that is a tougher question, right? What makes people want to buy that house in that location? What makes a business want to locate in that location? But one thing we have with markets is we have this revealing of the preferences by households and preferences by businesses of what they like in that location. So what we do in this study is we use those votes that households and businesses vote on every day with their feet and with their dollars to try and understand what they like about that location. 
Specifically here, we're using prices. So we're using the biggest one, housing prices. When households like a location, they pay more in housing prices. When businesses like a location, they pay more in real estate. So we can use those keys to kind of figure out what are the preferences that households and businesses have for that location. And it's not just housing prices, it's also wages. So we know that if businesses really like a place, they'll be willing to actually pay higher wages to locate in that place. Now for households, it's a little bit different. If households really like a place, right, that means that they'll actually accept lower wages to say live in this you know, beautiful location on the beach. So what we do is we use that data at the county level for every micropolitan area. So here we're talking about small towns. We're not talking about metropolitan areas. So we use those data on prices. So we're looking at what is the additional housing price you'd be willing to pay accounting for the size of the house, the age of that housing stock and the characteristics of that housing, right? What are you willing to pay above those housing characteristics? And here we see what pops up are counties like Kauai, Hawaii, the Garden State of Hawaii. We see Teton County, Wyoming, right? So this is in Yellowstone. We see Wasatch, Utah, Ta Taos, New Mexico, right? These are mountain ski towns, right? We see these pop up instantly, right? These are places that especially households think are great places to live. So when we look at places that have high housing kind of residuals here, that high housing prices, all else equal and higher wages, we think of this kind of section here of these micropolitan areas. These are great places to work and to live. So these places tend to have things like Naval Air Stations, federal institutions like the largest Coast Guard station in the US. Uh, they have uh, also large federal prisons here. So they have those places to work and also very nice places to live. Now in this bottom right section here, so these are places with kind of lower housing values, all else equal. These tend to be places that are more extractive. So these are a lot of drilling counties here. So you see a lot of places pop up in Texas that really they're all about drilling. So these are places that tend to be great places to work, maybe not as much great, a great place to live. So if there's one quadrant here you don't want to be in, it would be this bottom left quadrant. This bottom left quadrant are basically places that households don't think are very nice to live and businesses are, don't think they're very nice places to work either. So a lot of these counties have a history of things like severe racism, issues with high crime rates, a lot of issues going on with these counties, especially the farther you get to that bottom left quadrant here. So what we have here is we have this kind of smattering of counties that we can start to figure out um, why people like them or don't like them, right? What makes them a nice place to live or a nice place to work? But then the real question for a policymaker, right, is well, what do I focus on? So households and businesses don't always agree on what makes a place, quote unquote, kind of nice. So here, what we're looking at is we're starting to separate. We look at every county across the US and then we focus on those small counties. So here we want to look at, all right, what makes a place nice to live? This is all about that household perspective. These are the places where households are willing to pay higher housing prices for that location and accept lower wages to work in that location. So the bright blue here, these are the high quality of life counties. And you can see maybe right away the coast, right? Yes, people love to live on the coast. People love beaches. You can see Colorado. You can see Idaho there. People love mountains. Right, and you see an Appalachian area there in Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, bits of Tennessee, right? We start to see that orange area. These are places that are struggling with quality of life. But notice it's not just rural areas. There are rural areas here that aren't struggling with quality of life. There are rural areas here that do have higher quality of life. So this isn't just about, you know, living in larger, you know, towns along the oceans. Right, there are places here that are figuring out a way to have that higher quality of life. On the flip side of this are places that have this higher quality of business environment. And you see that some have both. So some have both higher quality of life and this higher quality of that business environment. And here actually the Appalachian area, Ohio, Pennsylvania, that area doesn't do as bad on quality of business, right? They offer pretty high wages for workers. They are all else equal. 
they do a little better on quality of business than they do on quality of life. So then the real question is kind of what should you go after, right? What can better predict the success of your small town? So here we look at one measure, people voting with their feet, population growth. So we want to look at the relationship between that quality of life and people voting with their feet. And we see that people are voting with their feet more likely to move to areas or we see higher population growth in areas that are focused more on quality of life. This is that upward sloping line you see there. What about quality of the business environment? We see no relationship there and actually a slight negative though not statistically significant relationship between the quality of the business environment and population growth. All right, but really this might be about jobs. So when we look at the relationship between quality of life and job growth, we see an even stronger relationship here between the quality of life in an area and the job growth that it experiences. What about the quality of the business environment? Again, we see no relationship here for these small micropolitan areas between quality of business environment and job growth. Now, another question we have was poverty rates. We see the same thing. We see poverty rates actually are lower in those higher quality of life areas over this time period. No relationship between quality of business environment. And so then what we do is we look at the data, all right? We see quality of life matters more for population growth, for job growth, for the success of these small towns, right? But what about these towns actually makes them have higher quality of life? And what we see is these are things like natural amenities, things where you are enhancing the natural amenities of your town, where you're building off, for example, recreation of these towns. This could be hiking, biking, uh, this could be skiing if you have it, right? These are things where you're building off the beautiful natural amenities that you have. And you're also building off your unique arts and culture. So this may be bluegrass festivals that you have in the Great Smoky Mountains that I have pictured here. And one thing that stands out among all of these are just solid public services. You need good schools, low crime rates. You have to have solid public so services to support the residents and households that move to this area. And that includes health. We need, we see that having better health outcomes is also associated with having higher quality of life. And finally, you need connection, right? So this means you need this area to be connected. This might be with broadband, this might be with biking trails, connection in terms of infrastructure, connecting your small town to a larger area. But generally we need connection here and a sense of community and connected to the larger community that is in this area. And so what we looked at this research is really to say, all right, what can help a place succeed? Hands down its quality of life. What can increase the quality of life in this area? We need to enhance the natural amenities that you have and make sure you have solid public services. And, I will be, and I'm free to answer any questions at the end as well. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, so uh, to all of our attendees, please feel free to post any questions either in the chat or Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. Um, and now I'd like to turn things over to Mike Belding, the chair of the Green County Commission. Good morning and thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share some information about Green County, Pennsylvania. We are the cornerstone of the Keystone State, as we say, and, and we're uh, the southwesternmost part of Pennsylvania with more than a 200 year heritage of fossil fuel industry and, and primarily coal up until recently in the 2000s when natural gas um, uh, became feasible to, um, to drill in, in our area. Uh, my personal background, I served 30, almost 30 years in the United States Marine Corps, grew up in Greene County and came back in 2012 after that 30 year absence. And uh, my experience that I'll discuss this morning is specific to Greene County is that's, that's where my uh, observation was of the natural gas industry. But upon my return, I would say we were in the boom era of the natural gas experience I personally miss that initial excitement of the gas industry's arrival uh, in southwestern Pennsylvania. I miss the narrative. I miss the, the um, 
dialogue about leases and royalties and uh, workforce requirements. But over time, you know, I caught up with that, that narrative uh, by talking to residents and, and people in the industry, but I did get to see the follow on of that, the decline in the, in the drilling uh, activity, the reduced truck traffic, the departure of the transient workforce that kind of, you know, in quotes, invaded the, the county. But a lot of that had positive short term impacts to our hospitality and service industries in particular. Um, I have read um, the Destined to Fail article and, and agree with the, the premise that the, you know, and, and I'll, I'll couch it this way, the height of the bar in expectations, um, I think was exaggerated from the industry writ large, not necessarily individual companies. And perhaps we wouldn't be having this conversation if the level of expectations were tamped down a little bit. But we saw residents uh, a resident saw this influx of temporary workers, quickly developed RV parks uh, for transient families, overfilled hotels and restaurants. And the perception was that certainly this would develop into a housing industry, adding children to our declining school populations, um, dispersion of this tax burden that, that has grown over time uh, and a growth of our population. And in fact, that didn't occur. The dr drilling activity faded. Um, in the end, you know, over that 10 dec decade year span, we're pretty much where we started. And the uh, exception is probably those large property owners, likely inherited farm or homesteads um, that really profited from the personal royalties of the natural gas industry. Um, there are a lot, there has been a continued decline of population in Greene County which started before this phenomenon of the natural gas, but has continued with that little plateau or even bump in uh, population. But there are a lot of families that used to struggle with, uh, you know, they're working day jobs and farming in the evening or on weekends, but they currently receive royalty checks out of the county um, in, in more uh, desirable places to live, as Amanda was discussing along the coast and, and so forth. Um, one of the sayings, local sayings in Greene County is how coal goes, so does Greene County. And we've watched this industry, you know, at least for the last 40 years or so um, with a predicted decline. And at one point, 50% of Greene County's assessed tax value was under its soil, under the ground in, in coal reserves. Today, that's down to about 32%. Although predicted, uh, you know, previous county administrations did not um, look at diversifying the economy. They were just riding that, that coal seam, if you will, as far as income and, and taxability of that asset. Um, Act 13 funding, that's the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's tax on that, the natural gas industry is proportionally given back to counties impacted by that natural gas industry. And it basically took the place of the decline in the coal reserves. So as the coal continued to go down and our tax base de declined, Act 13 funding was initiated in 2012 by the Commonwealth and it basically took the place of that decline, leveled the budget, but the problem was we floated a general fund budget with $37 million of Act 13 funding over a decade. And now that's also in decline, but we've not, diversified the economy, we've not increased the amenities, we've not done those things that will take the place of this declining Act 13 funding. Um, I will say, and I, you know, one of the statements I made, I, I think writ large, the industry overinflated the capabilities of natural gas to have a positive long-term effect on economies and diversifying economies. Um, but we've had some great partners in individual companies. There's a natural gas company's name on a $9 million community recreation center in Greene County. So those are one of the amenities the industry gave or a company gave back to the local residents. Um, there's been re more recent announcements. Uh, we're working with a natural gas company to invest a million dollars in rural broadband, increase those amenities, stabilize the population decline and so forth. Um, but overall, and, and kind of of the standards written in the uh, Destined to Fail article, I would agree with those 
um, those negative attributes of the industry writ large. You know, being new to the county government, one of the local government's primary responsibilities to main fis maintain the fiscal affairs of the county, but it's also to build an environment where other industries, entrepreneurs, and businesses have the capability to thrive. And the environment where families want to live, go to work, go to school, and play where crime is of a low rate and the cost of living is low. And I think Amanda's research bears that out. We have all of those things in Greene County. They just haven't provided an opportunity to blossom in those specific things. We're currently working on broadband. We're working on recreation. We're working on those, but there's really been a 25 or year or longer lapse of substantial initiatives to change those, those uh, attributes in Greene County. Um, I describe our workforce as generationally resilient we have a blue collar heritage and a proud legacy of dirty hands and capable minds. We certainly, uh, the example demonstrated by the Centralia article would have positive impacts on Greene County. Um, we've just started a so far unfunded business incubator initiative um, where we with partnership with a local university and we wanna grow unique non-fossil related businesses in an atmosphere that offers academic coaching, financial backing, and low capital overhead costs. We're exploring several opportunities in energy technology to include uh, solar farms on industrial brownfields. So we feel like we're 25 years behind. There's a new administration, new initiatives, and so forth in Greene County. And I would invite anybody that's interested to uh, ask questions, come along to Greene County, we'll give you a tour and talk about our initiatives. And lastly, I'll just uh, throw out that we increasingly discuss and are incorporating tourism as an economic diversity plan. Uh, we had a recent groundbreaking of a $5.7 million recreational area. It's partly funded, about one fifth really, um, and we're looking for other funding opportunities, but we're looking at, um, lead quality softball fields, kayak opportunities, hiking and biking that are all on at least 360 acre piece of property the county has for the next 99 years. So we're, we're on the recommended path. I think that, that a lot of this diversifying the economy in a couple of different pillars of economic growth, um, but we still feel that we're, we're well behind the power curve. The, um, the driving force of this is of course to um, reduce the departure of our families, our, our young folks that are graduating from high school or going away to college uh, that don't come back are one of the, the um, two audiences that we're really looking to either retain here or entice to come back. Um, so with that, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss Green County. We love our county, we love our heritage, um, and, and we're working really hard to be able to uh, transition a little bit and diversify those drivers into the next success, successful future for Green County. I look forward to everybody's questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are joined by former Belmont County, Ohio Commissioner Mike Bianconi via phone. Um, so I'd like to um, take a moment and just see if we can we can get Mike by phone um, to share a few thoughts. And then we do have some excellent questions that have been posed that um, I'm excited to get to after that. Hello, this is Mike Bianconi. Can you hear me? We can, go ahead, Mike. I right, thank you very much for uh, letting me join. I had some technical difficulties this morning. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about myself. I was a county commissioner from uh, the late 19 or the early 1990s 1993 through through and including the year 2000 to put your mind in where that was that's when bill clinton was president for eight years that's what when i was a county commissioner here in belmont county so uh some of my background i'm a lifelong resident of belmont county uh if belmont county is located about 60 miles southwest of pittsburgh pennsylvania along the ohio river across from wheeling west virginia uh I don't want to be redundant and say everything that Sean and Amanda and Mike said that they couldn't have said it better. I am not a uh, speaker, uh, but they couldn't have said it better. And I agree with what they said. Some of the things that helped me in my life, uh, I, I worked in the coal mine right out of high school for a little while, got laid off at an early age, 
joined the Air Force for a couple of years, and then I came back and worked in the steel mills until they shut down and uh, got involved in politics. But when I, what, what I'm kind of getting at, when I went in the Air Force, it, it opened my eyes because I saw a lot of things that I never was accustomed to around the country, and it made me see things uh, from a different perspective, very, very learning perspective. I came back, and I kind of got involved in politics because of that and been very vocal in, in my thoughts uh, on a number of issues. This uh, issue of the oil, natural gas, or environment really came to me from listening to a local uh, people, uh, Jill in the Barnesville area and, and others, and listening to Sean and, and Amanda. So I just want to say I'm supportive of, of their, their discussions and their thoughts, and I think we have to have an open mind and, and actually listening about the Centralia from the Pacific Northwest and reading that report was very, very eye-opening. So many times uh, as I go around the, the county here or whatever, people will say, you know, boy, I wish I had what they had, you know, like if you go to Columbus, Ohio, or, or even downtown Pittsburgh or different places. And well, we can here in Belmont County, only we have to have it with open eyes and open mind. And, and I'm encouraging local residents to do that, I guess, just like Sean, Amanda, and Mike were saying, to, to look at things a little bit different. We in Belmont County are a lot like Greene County with a heavy mining presence, although now we're into the heavy uh, uh, drilling for gas. I think we are the largest in the state in Belmont County. If we're not the largest, we're, we're right there second, but I think we're number one. We have the same problems in Greene County with the, uh, not problems, but the issues with the, the mobile parks coming in. They had to build hotels for all the workers coming in, and they've all left the same thing. So I don't want to be redundant on all my comments, but I do support uh, Sean, Amanda, and Mike's comments and their uh, what they've written there and the reports. And I always try to keep an open mind. And we're, I think we're all fighting for the same thing to make it better for everyone. I tell everybody, it's not about me. It's, it's not about me and my faith. It's about the people after me. That's who it's about. So uh, in, in our place here in Belmont County, we, we need to do more of that. I, I look back and I think about the Clean Air Act and different things that have happened that have really cleaned up our county over the years. I'm uh, going to be 65, so I've seen the old way of the uh, strip mining and the uh, acid, acid creeks and streams and, and laws and regulations come into effect to clean that up and to, to do it another way. And, and I think that's all that's needed now is to look at things to do it another way, just to have that open mind and, and, and look and see and think of what else is going on in our country, in our world, where we can make it better for everybody. So I don't want to be long-winded, but I do appreciate you letting me speak. And anything, any questions, I'll be more to answer, but I'm certainly certainly that Sean, Amanda, and Mike will do better than me. But thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. And I appreciate your patience through our technical um, challenges. So really appreciate your comments. And um, now we have some really great questions. Um, and I'd like to start with a question from Paul Goff from the Pittsburgh Business Times. Um, and this is actually directed to Mike Belding. Uh, Paul asks, one of the challenges that I see, and I live in coal country too, is trying to get to consensus on what needs to be done. There are a number of people in industry and labor who are against anything that would be considered green or against coal, gas, and heavy industry. How do you think that gap can be made up? And how do you, how do you talk to people about that? The, um, you know, being a new county commissioner and not having been here for a long period of time, I, I don't have, I'll say political affiliations within it, right? I'm just an individual and, and I'll, uh, you know, as a former military member for so many years, there was no politics. So you have to get away from politics and you have to have a transparent dialogue. There was a, uh, a huge initiative on the new commissioner's part. So two of three commissioners are new in January of 2020 to increase transparency, to increase the dialogue with nonpartisan discussions. I mean, just the, the facts and, and lay them out there. There was an article not long ago, probably four months ago, written by uh, Spotlight PA about the financial crisis in Greene County. And that young reporter came down and interviewed a lot of people for a couple of days and wrote a very transparent, by the numbers, here is where Greene County is. And those folks that were exposed to that 
or sought that information out cannot deny the fact that we need to diversify the economy. Um, so the next question is, how do you do that? And I think there's a lot of research out there. Um, I bring a diverse, uh, diverse background. I lived in 11 different communities in the United States while I was in the service. Most of them did not have fossil fuels, right? So what are, what are the other economic drivers that people have realized um, that are not related to a singular industry? And we can pull from those experiences. Even if, even if county or city leaders have to go out and, and travel two or three hours away and spend a weekend at a tourist destination, right? And see what that driver is and so forth. So to, to go back to that specific question, the most important thing from my point of view is open communications and transparency. We, even during COVID, we did um, town hall meetings. You know, we're the new uh, political figures in the county. We want to meet our constituents, learn from uh, them in their local hometowns. We went around and, and met at fire departments and so forth with all the CDC protocols, but engage those individuals. And when they get the facts, nobody can argue that we are going to maintain our economic stability with single source uh, financial drivers. So the next is what's the next best thing. And, and to Amanda's report, we are trying a lot of those. We've done a a lot of studies and within 60 miles of Greene County, you can pull 1.1 million people to a destination. Now you have to figure out what's gonna bring them here. And we're doing uh, increased activities at our fairgrounds, at our airport. Um, we're developing that Wise Carver project that, that will draw people. And we've not discussed, but our tax structure is upside down compared to the amenities we offer. And it's gotten that way over 20 years of increase in taxes primarily school district taxes, they consume 70% of our personal income, personal property tax in Greene County. So, you know, it's hard to entice people to live here. So the next best thing is to bring them here, have a tourism economic model where you infuse uh, money that travels here, right? Spend the weekend, spend the festival, spend a couple of hours in Greene County and infuse money into our economy while we're working on these other amenity parts and the quality of our school districts in order to entice people to live here. So uh, I hope that I think that covered everything. I don't want to um, belabor the point, but I, I will go back to open, transparent communication and discussion with all of those people, industry leaders that have uh, doubts about the future, citizens that have concerns about the taxes, the quality of their schools, what are we going to do and so forth. Uh, and without a penalty, right, you need to entice people to come in and, and be open and free without retribution. And I think that's what we're missing for a long time and, and we're there now. Now, if I may, I'd love to reinforce something that Mike said and that I think goes to your question, Paul, which is how do you talk to people who are in many cases pretty entrenched in their belief and faith in you know, in the coal and natural gas industries and, and, and many other aspects of life that have been constants in this region for decades. And when I first connected with Mike, the approach that I took was, look, you know, we're not looking at this from a pro-fracking or anti-fracking perspective or a pro-industry or anti-industry perspective. We're looking at the fact that the counties are getting a bad deal economically. Whether you're pro-industry or anti-industry, pro-fracking or anti-fracking, the facts on the ground that Mike emphasized a moment ago, you look at the numbers, it's a bad deal. And so even if you're a pro-industry, even if you're pro-fracking, that doesn't mean you should be for a bad deal. And that's really what we're trying to remedy. And part of that is basically exploding the myth that we're engaged in a jobs versus environment situation, because what we're seeing is that it's truly not that. And I'm hoping that because folks like Mike Belding are willing to step back and able to set aside, you know, ideological perspectives and simply look at the facts and simply realize that we want a good deal for our counties, regardless from, you know, the political perspective you come from, that that will 
manage to move people's hearts and minds on this issue. And I think it is moving them. And I think Mike's presence here demonstrates that. Thank you, Sean. I think, you know, you're touching on something that's related to a question that Kathy Ann Kowalski asked, which is that in your comments, you talked about the natural gas industry being structurally unable to deliver jobs and prosperity. Um, could you describe what you mean by that and how that shows up in the report that you're releasing today? Sure. Um, and I know, Kathy, you're from Ohio. And as you probably know, the seven counties in eastern Ohio that produce about 95% of the gas um, have received investments of over, according to the most recent Cleveland State report, over $80 billion of investment. And one of the questions that we had to grapple with in doing both the original report, but especially the one we're releasing today, is how in God's name can you invest $80 billion and not see any job growth or much change in economic activity? Or, and that proved to be an illuminating experience because what the report does is go through on a blow-by-blow -blow basis and identify all the leakage points that cause only a tiny fraction of that immense amount of money that was invested to actually enter local economy in the form local economies in the forms of incomes for residents, which they then turn around or can turn around and spend locally. Basically, what you'll see in the report is that overall in the 22 Frankalachian counties, only about 20% of the money that was ever invested or generated from the sales of gas ever entered those local economies. And in some cases, like in Eastern Ohio, it was less than 10%. And that's one of the reasons why the seven Eastern Ohio counties are the ones that frankly have suffered the most. Job loss, population loss um, in, you know, in, in the seven to 8% range during the fracking boom. And those leakage points that I mentioned, many of them are structural. They have to do with the fact that the industry is capital intensive rather than labor intensive. They have to do with the fact that the industry suppliers to a point Mike Belding made, both the suppliers and many workers in the industry are from outside the region. And so those uh, funds, those investments leave the region. And they have to do with the fact that, frankly, even for the money that does flow into the region in the form of royalties, relatively little of that money is spent. It's often either saved or, as Mike Belding pointed out, spent elsewhere by the recipients of the money. And of course, we also live in a region, and this is true of coal country generally, where there's been a long pattern of um, non-resident ownership of property. And so that portion of the royalties leave. Those things are all structural. They cannot be changed or at least easily changed through policy. And that's fundamentally the reason that even greater expansion of the natural gas industry will continue to produce the results that we've seen so far. Thank you, Sean. Um, the next question is for Amanda. This is also from Kathy Ann Kowalski, um, who asks, how would you relate the ratings from your study on quality of life and quality of the business environment for areas in Southeast Ohio and other parts of Appalachia with the reports that the Ohio River Valley Institute is releasing here today? So what we find is that in the areas in Appalachia, the areas that have really done a lot of natural gas drilling and really focused on their extractive industries, they have a decent quality of business on our rankings, but where they struggle is quality of life. And so even when you look at things like natural amenities, so Sean was just talking about kind of structurally why this was kind of set up not to be the big boom that, you know, the industry thought it would be. Um, we have things like the natural resource curse. And what that means is these areas that tend to extract their natural resources tend to do worse. Now, it's not a guarantee, right? Some areas that do this don't end up worse, right? It depends on how you handle the benefits of that. So what we've seen in the Appalachian area is that they haven't invested in that quality of life, making sure that they have, as they you know take out those resources, that they're doing something to maintain their environment 
and the physical capital, this kind of natural capital that they have in that area. And so you have this kind of trade-off going on. So throughout the country, what we see is that counties that have higher natural amenities do better. That's actually not true in Ohio. In Ohio, counties that have better natural amenities don't do as well. And it's not because Ohio and West Virginia and Pennsylvania don't have gorgeous natural amenities. If you drive from here to DC, you see it, right? West Virginia, right? You see it. They have gorgeous mount mountains. They have gorgeous hills, rivers, lakes. They have the natural amenities. But instead of building on those natural amenities, those extractive industries actually reduce it. And so you have part of this natural resource curse kind of is focusing on the wrong natural resource, extracting in natural resources and taking it out of your community instead of investing in the natural resources that you do have in your community. And so that's what we see generally in that Appalachian area is that it hasn't focused on quality of life. And really this is this inward look. I love how uh, Mike Belding also mentioned, right? First, we got to get people to look at the data. We're struggling, right? Why are we struggling, right? And then he talked about talking to people. Almost everything he said was, I have to talk to people, right? He's not flying to New York and say, what do you think about Appalachia? Would you move here, right? He's asking his current residents. And I think about this as like a business, right? So the Appalachian area needs, like, they need to focus on their current clients, right? Are their current clients happy? It's easier to expand a current business than it is to attract a new one in. Right? So if we're doing the things that help current residents, making it a nice place to live, investing in the natural amenities that residents get, investing in the community schools that their kids go to, right? then suddenly you have a different model. You're making your current clients happy and it's easier to attract those new clients, which I think is really a struggle. It has been a struggle in these Appalachian areas as they haven't diversified and have focused solely on that one extractive industry. If, if I may, I'd love to build on what Amanda just said and draw a very explicit line between the results that we're seeing in Centralia and the principles that Amanda identified as driving economic growth in her report. The three areas in which the vast majority of investments made in Centralia um, have been made are energy efficiency, education, and clean energy. And the first of those, and, and all of those, by the way, um, especially energy efficiency and education, contribute directly to the quality of life factors that Amanda is talking about. But they also have a number of economic characteristics that make them especially powerful. When you invest in energy efficiency, I'm, I said a moment ago that natural gas and coal are capital intensive, but not very labor intensive, which means you don't get many jobs for each dollar that you generate. Energy efficiency, which is heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, and insulating, and door and window replacement, and things that are done by local suppliers, even in relatively small towns, these are very labor intensive businesses. For each dollar that goes into them, they generate about three to four times as many jobs as a dollar spent or earned in natural gas. The next thing is they're locally delivered. These are businesses that are done by local contractors. And so when you spend money with them, the money stays in the local economy, they hire local workers and it has a, a multiplier effect locally. The third thing is that these kinds of investments have an annuity value. And that is that they cause savings on utility bills. So when you make energy efficiency upgrades, as in my case, when I redid the house in which I live, we managed to reduce our utility bills by $150 to $200 a month. And that's going to continue to be true probably long after I'm dead and gone and the next resident is living here. Um, and so the savings go on for decades. I know when I looked at, for instance, the three northern panhandle counties in West Virginia, Marshall, Ohio, and Wetzel, that have about 35,000 households, we determined that if you were to do the kinds of energy efficiency upgrades that are being made in um, Centralia, that residents there would save about $8 million a year on their utility bills. And that's money that would be recycled back into the local community. But circling back to Amanda's point, when you do energy efficiency, not just in private homes, but in businesses, workplaces, in schools and other public buildings, 
you are also contributing to an improved quality of life. And I was just down in Centralia last week and got to witness it and, you know, met with the folks there on the, on the coal transition grant board. They, you just walk around town and you see this is a nicer place to live and to have a business than it used to be. And so there is a profound intersection between Amanda's report, which in many ways was the, as I said, the inspiration for what we did and what is um, actually being realized in Centralia and what can be realized in communities, you know, where, where, where I'm from, I don't live there now, but, uh, but anyway, I, you know, and I, so I can't thank Amanda enough for the work that she's done in the direction in which she pointed us. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, I know we have a couple of questions that we haven't had a chance to get to yet. One from Kathy Ann Kowalski and one from Colin Jeromack. Um, we have your contact information from registering for the webinar. So we will follow up with you via email. Um, and in addition to everyone who registered, we'll be sending out links to the reports and a recording of the webinar. So all of this material will be available to you um, after the fact as well. Um, and I'd really like to just take this time to thank our panelists again, each of you for not only your contributions here this morning, but also the work that you do in your own communities. It's really, really incredible. And I think your comments today are a real testament to your commitment to the region and improving the lives of everyone who is living throughout this great region of Northern Appalachia and the Ohio Valley. Um, and Sean, thank you for your leadership in, in offering these reports. Um, we're very grateful to all of the reporters who attended. And again, we'll be following up, following up with um, responses to specific questions we didn't have a chance to get to, as well as copies of the re recording and the reports. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you very much.